Hello everyone. As part of our Better Outcomes webinar series, I'd like to thank you for joining us online today for this very special live broadcast. My name is Emily Eberly with Sachs Healthcare Communications, and I am your technical producer. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar, Saving Lives at the Bedside, Collecting Vital Signs. And now, I'd like to introduce you to Melody Keller, who is our moderator today. Melody is currently a nurse informaticist at Lakeland Regional Health Center in St. Joseph, Michigan. Since 2009, she has been actively working on the cardiac telemetry unit. Melody, welcome. And I'm so glad to be working with you for this special session. And we thank you for all of your support in moderating this important webinar for so many people today. Are you ready to get started? Thank you, Emily, for that kind introduction. Good morning or afternoon, depending on where you're located. The title of today's webinar is Saving Lives at the Bedside, Collecting Vital Signs. Speaking today on this very timely topic is a colleague of mine, Arthur Bragi. Arthur is currently the Chief Nursing Informatics Officer at Lakeland Health. Arthur Baragi has experience as a supervisor and clinical resource nurse in the cardiac unit. He has extensive experience in electronic health records, or EHR, and developed EHR competency courses for healthcare professionals at his facility. He has lectured on the technology topics at local and national healthcare meetings. Our speaker has disclosed no conflicts of interest. I would like you to know you will receive continuing education credits for this presentation. This educational activity is approved for one contact hour. The accreditation statements are listed on this slide. A link to obtain CE credits will be available at the conclusion of this webinar. And support for this educational activity is provided by Philips Healthcare. And now I would like to turn over this presentation to my colleague, Arthur. Arthur, are you ready to get started? Thank you, Melody, for your generous introduction. And welcome, everyone, saving lives at the bedside collecting vital signs. These are the learning objectives. At the completion of this activity, the participants will be able to discuss the necessity of collecting accurate vital signs, describe early vital signs training and competency checks, discuss the use of electronic health records integrated device and patient deterioration warning, and discuss the limitations of technology for vital sign monitoring. These next few slides explains how we implemented the vital signs process and the journey of struggles and accomplishments we experienced here at Lakeland. This is Lakeland Health. We are located on the Southwest side of Michigan. We have about 250,000 outpatient visits, 17,000 inpatient admits, 70, more than 71,000 ER visits, and 4,200 associates. We also have uh, 443 licensed bed in three different hospitals located uh, at the same location. So I know these are some of our awards and recognitions, and you know we take pride in that. Our recent awards was Truven Analytics and Lakeland was recognized in the top 15 health system. We're also HIMSS Stage 7 and Davis Award winner. Recently, we also received Michigan Governor's Award for reducing hospital acquired urinary tract infection. We are also Joint Commission accredited for Joint Cardiac and Stroke Center. At Lakeland, we focused on patient safety and patient experience. Like many other organizations at Lakeland, we have many challenges. One incident that still disturbs me today is uh, when I asked for a patient's vital signs and someone quickly wrote it down in a piece of paper, heart rate 70, respiration 18, temperature 37.4, and blood pressure 115 over 64. I, I questioned the validity of the vital signs. The person did not go back and uh, look at what the vital signs were, just quickly wrote it down for me. 
we also recognized that all the healthcare workers try to do their best with whatever they have and try to improvise when they lack in resource instead of blaming our associates. As a Lakeland care, care organization, we went back to make our vital signs are more accurate and less room for human errors. Just to give you more information on cost and in-hospital codes, only 20% of patients survives all hospital codes. The cost of codes is usually over $100,000. Most codes occur during weekends and off hours. At Lakeland, we wanted to have early warning at the bedside that could save lives and avoid excessive costs. We thought early warning at the bedside is the most effective than just having it on a dashboard somewhere else. Just like any other healthcare organization, we had our doubts on predictive analytics and early warning scoring system. We struggled to understand you know, how vital signs could be used to preventing codes and saving lives. We had to do our research and see what's out there, what's in the market, what other organization has accomplished. To my surprise, we found many research that's been out there, but very few implementations. This data is from codes that Lakeland experienced from April 2014 to March to 2015. As you can see, there were a total of 65 codes. CTU or cardiac unit had the highest number of cardiac arrest and followed by surgical care. We thought, hmm, cardiac unit, you know, makes sense. You know, they can have more codes, but on a why SCU or surgical care. We could have said, no, well, patient have codes. We can only do so much for everyone. And sometimes pe people die. In fact, this is interesting. If you don't do anything like calling codes or calling for rapid response, you are really saving money. Instead of accepting sudden cardiac arrest as natural phenomenon, as an organization, we decided to have zero code or cardiac arrest at Lakeland. We wanted to change the notion that people die in the hospital. In order to do that, first, we had to acknowledge the significance of accurate vital signs. Before the implementation of vital signs integration, we had 20 different brand of vital sign device in our organization. All the vital signs were written on a piece of paper and then transcribed into electronic health record or EHR. The time frame for collecting and recording this data was around 60 to 90 minutes in total. And sometimes the care providers, providers would forget to report the critical vital signs. The lack of knowledge when to escalate and initiate a rapid response was a big issue for us. There was lack of mutual understanding about the patient's condition between the nurse and the physician. Because of this issue, our goals and expectations for the vital sign integration was to save time with fewer clicks and upload the data in EHR from the vital sign device. Recognize patient deterioration early at the bedside. Having automatic vital sign data collection to save less transcription error. Obtain higher staff satisfaction with a user-friendly device. And be able to initiate early rapid response before a cardiac arrest. And the most importantly, 
save lives. We initiated a PDCA, that's plan, do, check, act, cycle for this project so that we do not miss any important elements. In the beginning, the most important part was to create a partnership with the owners of the vital signs. In other words, we were creating a partnership with nurses, physicians, nursing assistants, respiratory therapists, and any other discipline that involves patient care. We educated our staff, deployed the device, and implemented the vital sign process. Our education department took the initiative in creating a robust learning, learning kit, incorporating e-learning, videos, and hands-on training of vital signs and the device. The data gave us information on our performance and weakness. We communicated back to the clinician and changed the process as needed. Our goal. Our goal is to collect accurate vital signs. Accurate vital signs is the best predictor of patient deterioration. The components of accurate vital signs is reliable associate. Now what can that be? A person who can understand the importance of accurate vital signs and takes the ownership of providing safe patient care. Having the right tools include a reliable and user-friendly vital sign device that can deliver accurate vital signs. A good training engages the associates in a learning experience that helps them to retain the information that are taught and perform the job accurately. The ability to validate the data is one of the most important ways of assessing the correct vital signs and provide a platform for reporting back to the clinicians. Training is one of the most important part of this project. It is also important to assess the gaps of knowledge and education. We created a platform of e-learning and hands-on training that could be used repeatedly for additional training. At the beginning, our nursing leaders were surprised to learn the inconsistent process of vital signs collection. For example, coaching the patient to take deep breath for higher oxygen level, using wrong sized blood pressure cuff or wrong location of the limb. Often patient oral temperature was taken right after a cold or hot beverage consumption. On, any, on another occasion, during the vital sign collection, a patient oxygen saturation was indicating 89%. However, the patient was not symptomatic at all and did not show any signs of respiratory distress. On closer look, we identified the patient's finger to be cold and have less blood circulation. We replaced the oxygen sensor to the ear, and voila, we received 99% oxygen reading. We acknowledge these errors as our organizational failure to appropriately educate our associates on different variables that can influence the vital signs. We validated the training by following the associates and therefore it helped us to create an excellent training process and culture of excellence. How often do you think you were asked to do something important but never given the right tools? For example, you have only one size of a blood pressure cuff that does not fit the patient. This would definitely not provide the accurate blood pressure for this patient. The right tools are essential for getting the job done.
our goal was to give the right tools to our clinicians. How we did this was to successfully identify the patient to the vital sign device but by way of scanning. The process includes the nurse or nursing assistant by scanning her ID badge, scanning the patient armband, and validating this, validating that this is the correct patient. Then he or she proceeds to collect the vital signs. We also integrated the data for temperature, blood pressure, pulse, oxygen level into EHR. This data would automatically upload into EHR after the nurse or nursing assistant validates the data on the vital sign device. This allows us to have real-time vital sign alert at the bedside. The device were wireless, mobile, that can be moved from room to room, use disposable blood pressure cuffs, and are easy to clean for infection prevention. Because our organization already had the VSA or vital sign alert system in EHR, we kept the same VSA algorithm for less confusion. Our VSA algorithm does not include the mu scoring or mental status change, which is modified early warning system. In the algorithm, the nurse is instructed to assess the patient, measure the urine output, skin color, breath sounds, and level of consciousness, and any new symptoms. For our new phase, we would like to include a more advanced predictor that involves utilizing more patient data. So th there is nothing against mu scoring system. It just, it worked better, the VSA for our organization, for our setting. After taking a full set of vital signs, an alert score will populate on the vital sign device. This tells the nursing assistant or other clinicians on what to do next. If they get a score of zero to two, the monitor tells the clinician to monitor the vital signs as indicated per policy. If they get a score of three to four, the monitor tells the clinician to reassess the vital signs in two hours and also inform the nurse of the result. For a score of five to eight, the clinician is informed to reassess the vital signs every hour until the score reaches less than five, and also to inform the nurse of the result. The nurse will then evaluate for the need of calling a rapid response. Our nursing assistants embrace this new process and diligently informs the nurse of any score of three and higher. The barrier to mu scoring system at the bedside was nursing assistant are not allowed to assess the mental status of a patient. The nursing assistant and the nurse both loves the process as the process helps them to work as a team. For our rapid response team, we included the clin critical care residents, clinical resource nurse, house supervisor, attending hospitalist, respiratory therapist, and the primary nurse. We currently use an overhead page system for our rapid response and code blue. Activating rapid response is not easy, and any nurse can tell you how intimidating it can be. Our organization took a multidisciplinary approach to promote the rapid response call. At the beginning, the floor nurses faced with the res resistance. However, with proper education and training, we learned to embrace the rapid response. We implemented the project in two phases. First phase included orthoneuro and post-surgical floor, 
phase two included the rest of the medical surgical unit. The first phase of this project was a trial where we learned different aspects of device integration. The success of this phase helped us to design the next phase of the project. The implementation timeline uh, was from April 2016 to January 2017. During our implementation, we identified the need for Wi-Fi access point upgrade as the associates identified delay in data upload during our first phase of implementation. For this reason, our real implementation timeline was pushed back to March 2017. Our phase two included 21 departments from three different hospitals. It took a collaboration of many people from different disciplinary team to implement this project. Some of the key departments were Lakeland IT, Biomed, Electronic Health Record Analyst, trainers, educators, and nursing management, nursing managers, and everyone. During the go live of this project, we provided elbow support to our associates and resolved any issue related to connectivity. We successfully integrated to device with our risking, without risking any patient lives or major shutdown. As with any process, there is always anxiety and apprehension to change. Change can be positive or negative when implementing a new process. But our staff was willing to help initiate the new vital sign process. Even though we had many challenges, our staff was willing to troubleshoot and provide feedback to improve the process of vital sign collection. This early warning scoring dashboard is displayed on a 70 inch monitor and was placed on each unit in a huddle or multidisciplinary room for easy access and visibility. The dashboard displays the patient room number, name, current VSS score, previous VSS score, and time since last VSS score. The score includes the heart rate, oxygen saturation, blood pressure, temperature, respiration, and blood pressure cuff placement. At the beginning of each shift, the charge nurse identifies the high-risk patient by utilizing the vital sign alert score and usually the highest number score changes the color to yellow and red so it makes it makes it easier for the charge nurse to identify any high risk patient The graph indicates associates using the vital sign device and identifies the associates needing more training. The green represents direct upload of vital signs. The blue represents manual entry of vital signs. The associates with high number of manual entry shows that he or she needs help on how to improve the new process. Now, um, here's an example of a 70-year-old patient who came in with a vital sign alert score of 3. And later, with the alert of 5, the nurse was able to initiate a rapid response due to the patient deterioration. Due to the diligence of the clinicians, the patient was able to get the early help he or she needed and was eventually discharged in a stable condition.
This is another story of a 65-year-old patient who ended up having three rapid responses called on three different occasions. Again, due to the early warning scoring, the patient received the help he or she needed and was able to be transferred to critical care unit for closer look and intervention. After implementing the new vital sign process, we had some learning experience. The graph here shows what happened when protocol is not followed. The orange line represents vital sign score and the blue line represents the elapsed time from the next vital sign when it was taken. When the patient score was a five, a proper intervention did not happen for seven hours. The patient declined with a vital sign score increasing to eight after three days. The correct protocol would have required every two hour vital signs. The slow deterioration of the patient condition could have been detected with the score system and the patient could have received help sooner. A patient's slow decline, often not recognized by the clinician, but it is better recognized on a graph. For example, a patient's baseline heart rate could be 50, and that could be normal for him or her. However, slow increase of the heart rate to 90 still might not be noticeable to the clinicians. So then a heart rate of 90 might be high considering the baseline of the heart rate 50. A graph allows a clear visualization of the patient's slow decline or subtle change in patient condition. After we collected the data, we also identify the risk of assigning more patients to the clinicians. The graph here shows the associates are unable to follow the protocol. Higher patient load, higher patient load requires them two to three hours longer to collect the next set of vital signs. This puts our patients at high risk. This graph shows the overall vital sign alert score distribution in our organization. It's about like 2,546 patients have a score from zero to three. 191 patients have score four to six. Very few patients ever get to a higher score. Most of the early warning scores are from zero to three. Most of the patients are not critical and do not need intervention. Nurses knows when to intervene even before it reaches a critical vital sign number of eight. The entire process of early warning scoring has created a new culture of safety at Lakeland. Some of the mistakes we found in phase one were corrected in phase two. The focus on the vital signs reduction, vital sign was re-education and gave the associate time in getting accustomed to the new device before go live of the project. We tested the Wi-Fi signals and upgraded the Wi-Fi access points to have better connection and smooth data upload. The e-learning helped us to minimize 
the classroom training and helped the associates learn on their own pace. Each nursing managers identified their super users, who also helped in providing hands-on training to their co-workers. After the second phase, after the second phase of implementing the project, where are we now with codes? It started with 65 codes, and currently, in 2017, our code blue dropped significantly, and rapid response increased considerably. The blue bar shows rapid response calls, and the orange bar represents code blue, or cardiac arrest. This number is raw, that means it's not adjusted to patient days. In collaboration with our physician's team, the vital sign alert score, we were able to effectively use the rapid response to intervene early and avoid codes. In 2017, we had seven codes so far and are projecting a possible of 24 codes for the year. It is based on the last five months of data, averaging two codes per month. This would indicate a 63% reduction in codes. Our goal is to eliminate cardiac arrest from surgical floor and lower more our codes in our hospital. Next, I'd like to talk about what is stopping us from collecting accurate vital signs. We, we noticed that we are still struggling to obtain a proper count of respiration. As you can see, Though the normal respiration is from 12 to 20, 18 is the most popular respiration for our patients at Lakeland. The data from the report shows more diverse respiration counts after the vital sign education. Although 18 and 20 are the most popular respiration, we often see 13, 17, and so on. The barriers to accurately count respiration that we noticed is because associates are distracted during the vital sign collection and they are less likely to count the respiration for a full 60 seconds. Most often, the associates are guessing the respiration. Guessing, guessing the respiration poses a risk especially for post-op patients and with low respiration. Another common mistake is uh, when someone mistakes hyperventilation for anxiety. Also, when a patient has combination of anxiety and pain medication, it can lead to respiratory arrest if the patient is not monitored correctly. So what is the solution? You know, a solution to this problem could be an electronic respiration monitor device. There are respiratory pods in the market that could be used in collecting accurate respiration. Our goal is to incorporate the respiratory sensor or respiration sensor in our next phase of the project. Some of the limitations of technologies are lack of knowledge on wireless technology, um, slow FDA process in limiting the innovation, unable to detect challenge users. For example, 
the device cannot detect and flag if a caregiver using a wrong size of blood pressure cuff. Providers warning, providers warning or VSS score warning can come up, but does not in, indicate what to do or does not provide an intervention. It still depends on the nurse to decide whether he or she should follow the protocol and initiate the rapid response. We realized that collecting accurate vital signs is the key element to be successful in early warning scoring system and in saving lives. We can have an expensive vital sign device, awesome rapid response team, and a sophisticated early warning scoring system displaying on a 70-inch monitor. But if we fail to collect accurate vital signs, the rest of the process of early warning scoring system becomes impractical. However, all, all four elements that's including accurate vital sign collection, a rapid response call, a good device, early, war early warning scoring system, together can guarantee that your organization will have a stellar reputation in saving lives. So, in conclusion, it took a village to implement this project. We worked really hard. The hard work is appreciated when, when a life can be saved. The pain, there is pain, but it's also short-lived, but the achievement that's all you can celebrate. It takes patience and time to change a broken culture. Remember, not never to give up, modify, mentor, and evolve. Thank you very much, Arthur, for your informative presentation. Also, thank you to the audience for your attention today. Now, I would like to open up the presentation for several questions that we have received. Um, the first question, and I apologize if I say anyone's name incorrectly, is from Sariv. And she asks, what does the 20% save hospital codes mean? And Arthur, I'm, I believe she's referring to slide number 14 when we talked about 20% um, survive all hospital codes. Um, thank you, Melody, for the question. Um, so yes, that comes from our research. Um, so that means like in hospital, if you have 100 codes and you called code blue, people comes in, takes care of that patient, only 20% of that, so 20 people will survive from that 100% patient coding. Um, so that's really you know low number. Um, calling a good code does not always save lives. Um, I hope I answered um, you know well. What do you think, Melody? I think that's fine. I think um, you answered it well, Arthur. I'm going to move on to Jonathan's question here. He said, in case this is not covered, where is the location of vital signs taken? For example, apical pulse versus radial, temperature, rectal versus um, axillary, groin, etc. So I'm, I'm assuming he is um, asking where on the monitor are these taken or any thoughts, okay. Arthur? Right, so um, pulse, it's been collected from two different uh, locations. So when it, if it's uh, um, they're using the 
oxygen sensor. It's also collecting the heart rate from that. Also, it can come from the uh, blood pressure cuff. From there, the heart rate can um, be extracted and um, uploaded in EHR. Um, also, temperature, the probe is uh, with the device. Um, so in our organization, we have oral uh, thermometers. Um, and the data comes right into the uh, device uh, before the upload. It can be also done um, rectally, but the probe needs to be changed and the probe color, um, it will be red and the nurse or the nursing assistant um, for the rectal temperature that will be the nurse doing that uh, will um, change the setting on the monitor uh, as a rectal temperature. Okay, thank you, Arthur. Um, next is Timothy. He asked, and I believe we referenced this in slide number 44, um, he asked how many codes since 2014 or since the implementation of correctly collecting vital signs, so how many codes have we had? And I believe in slide number 44 we talked about that, that we, um, we started with 65 codes. I don't know if you want to intervene here, Arthur, and, and how our codes have um, significantly dropped in 2017. Um, right, Melody, you um, you were correct. Um, so to 2017, we have uh, seven codes so far. So you know, I was being generous in you know, adding two codes for every um, every month. Uh, I'm I'll try to go back and um, see if it will work. Um, going back to the slide um, what has been referred to um, here and then here um, so the orange represents the codes and you can see in january we had two codes that's the entire organization um, and then um, march um, february no codes march to april one and may um, two codes um, but you can see the significant increase in uh, rapid response um, and and uh, it just started happening um, as soon as we implemented the the project in you know, education and, um, and everything in combination, I would say. Arthur, a second part to his question was, do the codes still most often oftenly occur on weekends and on off hours when there is less staff on? Yes, good questions, and you are correct. Um, we we notice that uh, the codes happen um, usually weekends and um, the early hours when nurses um, are busy getting ready, you know, for the shift change, um, and sometimes the supervisor, house supervisor, they're also busy. Um, getting ready for the uh, oncoming shift, some morning shifts. Um, so um, yes, the trend has been still uh, similar um, and we are looking into um, adding physicians um, or on-call physicians uh, during that time um, and adding the um, residents, CCU residents helped to get the rapid response team early at the site or at the um, location where the patient needs the help. Thank you, Arthur. Um, Maribel, she has a question if we are going to be discussing um, regarding pediatric vital signs. So I don't know if you want to talk about why we didn't include that. Um, yes, so when we implemented the um, the vital signs we also notice that um, we do not have um, you know like an algorithm um, or integrated part for the pediatrics now our organization uh, we have a smaller pediatric community um, it's a small unit uh, usually you know we get uh, three to four patients and um, usually we ship our uh, pediatric patient if it's get critical. So that means you know, our organization cannot support uh, neonatal um, ICU, um, that level of care. 
so right now uh, we are still looking into that um, because we um, our um, manager pediatric manager is requesting um, to add the the pediatric early warning scoring system um, to be added in our vital signs um, the process okay we have another question from Tim he asks how many clinicians just put down the first vital sign they see because they are rushed he's actually got two parts to this question um, he says we need to adopt the practice that if there is a questionable vital sign that we retake it or verify it when we um, check the vital signs in EHR a good question and um, it was interesting so after the implementation when we validated um, our process and also validated the workflow for the nursing assistant um, we noticed that a nursing assistant you know they're doing really good job so here how they do it when they go and take a vital signs and they find uh, out of parameter or a higher score they redo it and if the score comes up high for example VSA score of three to four then they inform the nurse and tell them that you know I did this vital sign I redid it is still showing high you need to come and assess this patient and that's when the nurse comes and um, will assess the patient if they need a manual blood pressure um, and and uh, be uh, counted you know, manually with the stethoscope um, they make that call okay and we have a good question here from Sandra and maybe Arthur you could reiterate kind of what you talked about earlier she wanted to know do your vital sign machines download the vital signs straight into our electronic health record or do they have that capability so yes um, it goes in two parts um, first validation goes um, identifying the patient um, and also identifying the person who is taking the vital signs so the nurse or the nursing assistant scan their ID badge with barcode and scans the patient's armband that has also barcode that identifies that this is the right patient and also pulls the data um, call it ADT data that means you know the patients uh, connecting to the patient's chart in uh, EHR so after collecting all the vital signs um, even the respiration could be added on the monitor just pressing um, the touch screen number um, they can add you know, 16 or 12 respiration and when they're um, they're set they validate the data and press um, save and it uploads the data it turns green indicating that it's been communicated with the EHR and it went to EHR um, so it's a really good process um, if it does not go in for some reason um, Wi-Fi connectivity um, it it can turn a different color or blue color um, indicating that uh, it did not go in um, and then uh, the nursing assistant have to um, manually enter it in uh, EHR but right now we are having 80 to 90 percent of the, the vital signs uploaded directly um, for um, for special occasions like manual blood pressures uh, that's being collected with a manual uh, dynamap or um, you know hand um, pump um, blood pressure those are still being entered um, at the computer at the bedside okay and Alan asks did you change or reduce the number of different monitors used to collect the data yeah absolutely so that was the best part right um, and um, our managers loved that so we had like 20 different kind of uh, vital sign machines um, we collected from who knows you know uh, before my birth probably uh, it was still working um, 
but I don't know, you know how um, how valid was the those uh, numbers were. Um, so we were able to um, bring down to one kind of vital signs device um, throughout our organization. Um, also, our nurses floats from um, different um, location to the other location, and it made it a consistent uh, workflow, a consistent um, device, um, and uh, the nursing assistant and the nurses um, had a better um, experience. Um, so far, um, when I did an assessment to the nurses um, and the nursing assistants, they are saying, um, it's saving them about uh, 30 minutes to 40 minutes uh, per vital signs, per collecting the vital signs. That means you know, if they have uh, six to eight patients, it's saving them 30 to 40 minutes each time. And we have a question from Mark. He asked, um, did you have software adding up the VSA scores, or was it manually entered by a clinician? So I believe you answered some of this, but if you could kind of expound on that. Right, so that was another you know, awesome thing. Um, it was automatically calculated um, in the device and giving the score. So everything is automated, less transcription error, less human error. Um, and it's quite easy. All the information, all the vital signs goes in, and the device smart enough to calculate the score and projects it at the device so the nurse knows what to do. Also, it um, presents um, and informs the nursing assistant to call the nurse or redo the vitals and tell them when the next vital sign they should take for that score. Thank you, Arthur. And Denise, she has a question. Um, what evidence did you use to determine the ranges for all vital signs that need to be reported to the nurse? In other words, how did you determine the high or low ranges for each vital sign? Um, so vital sign alert scoring system, the algorithm, we, we borrowed that um, VSS scoring uh, algorithm um, and the algorithm um, gives us the score. So the nursing assistant or the nurse gets the score and reassess the patient. Um, the score is an indication that some change is happening. You know, for example, you know, a kidney failure patient or a dialysis patient can always have um, lower blood pressure, and that could be normal for her. So in this instance, it won't work the VSA score. This instance, the nurse have to decide whether um, she or he should, um, you know, activate rapid response or not, um, because in this case, you know, the heart blood pressure could have been um, lower. So the range um, still goes back to the nurse and um, on nurse's discretion to look at the trend, what's happening, um, what where the patient was and where they are right now. Um, and, uh, you know, the scoring is there um, to help uh, to help to see a projection or a trend um, in helping to decide the uh, is the patient deteriorating, going bad, or getting better? Okay, Arthur. Um, Eric has got a two-part question here. He wanted to know, we often find that getting buy-in from our CNO, CMO, and clinicians for a new process or product is very different from getting buy-in from our IT group, which is different from getting buy-in from the CFO or CEO, CEO excuse me, et cetera. How did Lakeland manage to get this project through the different divisions within the hospital? Um, right. Um, always, you know, we need to show or uh, CFO likes to see a return on investment. 
you know, how much uh, or when are you going to get back the money you're spending. Um, our organization, our um, our CEO is uh, a big time um, patient centric. So in our organization, we strive to be the best um, in saving lives and providing the best care um, and providing the patient experience. So when you bring a patient, um, their experience and their life, uh, the money, you know, money is nothing to that. When I went and explained to our CFO that, you know, how about I guess your blood pressure or how about I, you know, get your respiration um, and I and I miss something that, you know, you're struggling. But now how about your children? You know, what do you think about your children um, being um, not treated well or missing that in a critical uh, point where a patient could be or your loved one could be bleeding? So when they realize that, you know, it's good on paper, but it could happen to them, then they like to talk and negotiate and um, want to um, bring in the best for the organization, best for their community, and best for them. Thank you, Arthur. That will have to be our last question. Um, I would like to thank the audience for your great questions. And at this time, I would like to ask Emily to conclude the presentation. Thank you. OK, great. Wow, what a lot of details and an excellent presentation. I'd like to thank you very much for your time, both Arthur and as well to you, Melody, for being our moderator today. It's been such a pleasure working with you both. And I'd like to thank each and every one of you, our guests in the live audience today, and as well those of you in a future time who are attending this recorded session. We thank you for your time and your thoughtful attention. And now this does conclude our session for today. Take care, everyone, and bye for now. We'll see you again next time.